Listen, kiddo, I get it. I don't like the two-party system. I think our country's corrupt. And quite frankly, I don't want to vote for Biden. It feels like voting for a Republican. But I'm gonna do it. You want to know why? Because the alternative is a fucking fascist. A fascist is a fascist. Maybe we can have the conversation about dismantling the two-party system when a fascist isn't running. Maybe we can do that later, kiddo. Champ. Chief. Maybe we can talk about it later. Hello, this is Alpha Bunga Bunga. The date is Tuesday, the 15th of September. I'm Alex, and George and Phil are here. Yes. Hey, what's up? That's correct. Actually correct. <laughs> um, and today we're talking about anti-fascism. And to do that, we're once again joined by David Broder, a historian and Europe editor at Jacobin. Hi, David. How's it going? Um, you're back in Rome now, right? Yeah, that's right. I've just been back here a week. Uh, very good. I mean, for listeners, uh, we recorded with David last week on uh, his book about um, about the rise of populism in Italy, about the right populists in Italy, uh, which you'll probably be hearing after this episode that you're hearing right now comes out, uh, just to um, clear up any confusion. And actually, that's probably ended up confusing you a lot more. Um, yeah, that's really, that is actually confusing. You know, <laughs> I'm confused as well as to what we're recording and what the date is. <laughs> yeah. Um, talking about confusion, um, have we all got our little uh, shields and swords um, to fight off the uh, the Proud Boys in our great anti-fascist struggle? I thought swords and shields are what the fascists have. I don't know. I mean, I, they're all kitted out in kind of slightly cartoonish um, weaponry, I think. Well, maybe maybe the, the, the kind of Pop, the kind of rightists in the US aren't don't have uh, cartoonish guns at all actually they you are real. kind of bragging you are kind of bragging online Alex I saw you you retweeted a photo from Portland saying like I've seen like uh, I've seen bigger fights at football matches <laughs> well yeah that was it I mean I think they were fighting with umbrellas um, and then stopped to allow um, a large man to cross while they uh, withheld from further conflict for about 30 seconds and then rejoined the the struggle the final struggle by the sounds of it it's true I mean I um, you know uh, some of it I have to say what I've seen online does have a kind of a weirdly um, ritualistic quality to it and seems and from what I've read about the kind of the weird dropout scene in Portland it does seem like um, these people know each other quite well um, for their regular um, kind of ritualistic punch-ups that are you know apparently uh, not even as brutal as some of the fights that Alex has been in when he's an ultra so <laughs> uh, yeah um, well I mean you know I, I we don't want to be too sarcastic about it um, and obviously we've kind of taken seriously what's going on in the US right now but you see those images especially from Portland where uh, you know famously it's where young people go to retire <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to take it uh, entirely seriously, um, but actually, I well, certainly. I mean, seeing you know, seeing the face-offs with the cops is one thing, but the kind of the staged kind of battles between um, protesters in various kind of fancy dress or um, uh, black block style anti far protest protesters with kitted out, like you say, with kind of homemade shields and um, helmets stamped with. Um, you know, stamped with the uh, hammer and sickle and then all the weird kind of superhero Spartan costumes on the other. I mean, it all seems a bit ridiculous to that extent, um, at least, you know, what we see kind of online. So, David, any any take on uh, any take on these kind of struggles in the US? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I think uh, the it's definitely the case that uh, you know, Trump is different from previous Republican presidents in terms of egging on the uh, far right protesters, and of course the famous, uh, you know, there's some good people yeah. uh, on both sides, kind of thing. But I, I just the reason why I find any kind of discussion of uh, the rise of fascism or uh, Weimar Republic analogies and so on just so in extremely uh, unsatisfactory, misleading. Uh, even self-glorifying is 
uh, for for the liberals and so on who are pushing uh, this kind of analogy is is just like the entire dimension of uh, armed conflict is 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 missing. You know the 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 fascism of the 1920s has to do with the mass brutalization of World War One and the millions of armed men dumped on the streets afterwards. So you know you can say well it's never uh, you know fascism will there's always these kind of uh, incantations like the uh, Umberto Eco art- article and and so on which are like well of course fascism will always appear in different guises and in a modern and different version uh, which is basically saying the thing that yeah. defines fascism is precisely the sense is precisely the fact that it's unrecognizable yeah and I, I think that's <laughs> I mean you know we may as well say. Uh, you know, why not extend it backwards in history too and say Henry VIII was a fascist because he was authoritarian. He totally was. He totally was. Um, misogynist as well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, I don't, don't think you can be misogynist if you have that many wives. Um, <laughs> he loves women. Yeah. Understanding it. Um, right. So, um, All right. Let, let's not get cancelled here. Yeah, let, let, let's, uh, let's crack on. Um, so obviously, you know, as you can gather from the foregoing discussion, uh, anti-fascism uh, has been in the news a lot recently. Um, Donald, Donald Trump seems to think or likes to pretend to think that Antifa is actually an organization whose travel records and c- communications can be subpoenaed. Um, and of course, lots of people draw the conclusion that because Trump is anti-Antifa, uh, that must mean that he is a fa, uh, a fascist, that is. Um, so let me just say one example, which I think is very revelatory of the current moment and the way that these things are being discussed, um, the analogies with the 1930s that are being made. Um, so the prominent Anglo-American blogger, Andrew Sullivan, who, um, if you're not familiar, um, he is a conservative, he's gay, he's Catholic, and is a former editor of a liberal magazine, The, the New Republic. Um, so he recently blogged, let's be frank about this and call it by its name, he says in reference to current events in the US. This is very Weimar. The center has collapsed. Armed street gangs of far right and far left are at war on the streets. In the same piece, he then declares, The minute the authorities appear to permit such violence, it is destined to grow. And if liberals do not defend order, fascists will. So, although Sullivan might not be totally representative, um, he is pretty mainstream and fairly centrist, I guess. And he also takes a lot of political boxes. Um, So I think it's fairly... Uh, relevant to bring him up as an example and he makes a direct appeal to to anti-fascism it's interesting actually because before the 2016 election in the lead up to it he said that trump was actually not even coherent enough to deserve the fascist label Um, but after the election he's he called trump an openly proto-fascist cult leader um and has and has recently referred to him as uh referred to his rhetoric at least as neo-fascist um so there's definitely a call there to a certain anti-fascist position um against trump and I think we should get this out of the way straight away before I bring in David to discuss a bit more about the history of anti-fascism, um, that Trump is not a fascist. And we've discussed this uh, a number of times on this podcast. More specifically, you can look up episode 129 with Corey Robin on why exactly that's the case. Um, and in fact, most of those wheeled out today as supposed fascist threats around the world aren't really deserving of the label. Uh, you can consider Orban in Hungary or Duterte in the Philippines. Um, and again, We've done episodes on this. Check out episodes 33 and uh, 52, 52 if you want more on that. It's always good to have the numbers on hand. Uh, even Bolsonaro in Brazil, who probably comes closest to being an actual fascist, uh, isn't really. I mean, you couldn't call his government a fascist government. And but we'll talk a little bit more about that later as we go on with this. To basically call these figures fascist brings in all sorts of historical confusions and misses out why our context is so radically different from interwar Europe, as David already alluded to at the beginning. And again, we'll go into more depths on this in just a second. Um, so we've got David on um, because one, we like, always like to have him on. Um, we had him on recently, again, in this episode, which will come out in the future um, on the populist rights rise in Italy. And, uh, you know, a little bit of discussion of uh, Bunga Bunga on there. And uh, just to remind listeners, you should only come here for your Bunga Bunga uh, listening experience. Uh, nowhere else will satisfy in the same way. <laughs> um, if you don't get that reference, um, I'm not going to clarify it for you. Um, 
But uh, so for now, we're going to be focusing on the contemporary uses of anti-fascism because uh, David written uh, a relatively recent article in Jacobin on uh, why this is not Weimar Germany. Um, sad it should need to be stated, but uh, nevertheless, it was and it's a very good article uh, in doing so. So let's start there, actually, uh, David. Um, firstly, could you tell us what your argument is, not so much in relation to Germany, actually, but let's start with Italy, where fascism started um, and why anti-fascism is problematic. Okay, so uh, I think it's really important to uh, draw a distinction between um, the idea of fighting against fascism uh, and the need to uh, you know, defend uh, democratic rights and the labor movement and minorities from fascist attacks. Um, and then anti-fascism as a kind of organizing principle of political life and, and really a kind of uh, deus ex machina kind of constantly called in to sort of regulate the terms of political debate. Uh, in particular, this is because, uh, as we see with the, uh, the sort of calls for um, to, sort of attempts to uh, damn the left for supposedly not uh, supporting Joe Biden enthusiastically enough, and there are plenty of recent... Uh, uh, analogies as well in other cases, you know, including with the Berlusconi's uh, rise in uh, Italy and the and the centre left opposition to him. Um, basically, it's the use of anti-fascism as a call to sort of rally the troops and to suppress other kinds of political divide and other kinds of political issues. Um, so uh, this is this kind of thing where um, there can be no discussion of. Uh, Medicare for all, or, or, or in fact, even the demands of um, Black Lives Matter and issues of the racial justice and police violence so in the US, basically the, the, the kind of use of anti-fascism to marginalize those kind of demands and, and reduce everything to just voting uh, for Biden and therefore voting against Trump, the, the supposed fascist, uh, and the use of that to, to kind of dramatize uh, 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 the political debate and, and, and silence uh, silence uh, the left. Um, so the reason I wrote the article uh, in particular, though, is that the, the historical examples of Italy and uh, Germany in the interwar years are, are, are often used in this, in this same vein. And what they always draw on is uh, left-wing accounts, left-wing critiques of the Communist Party, uh, in particular drawn from the Trotskyist tradition, uh, which seek to blame the communist parties for allowing uh, the fascists and, in the case, Nazis uh, to come to power. Hmm. Um, so really the idea is like, well, the communists are too purist and sectarian. They failed to understand the significance of the fascist threat uh, and therefore spent their time fighting social democrats rather than uh, the, the necessary and primary fight to defend uh, democracy itself. Yeah, and that, and that accusation of purism is obviously very contemporary. I mean, it, with any argument that is made on the left that, you know, one might not vote for Biden or one might not bother or that they're all the same or whatever or anything like that, um, the argument is always made that that is a, that is a reflection of a pathological purism on the left. Um, but without talking about today, um, what was what is the problem with that interpretation of that history in the 1920s in Italy and in 1930s in, in Germany? Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I think the, the main problem with that is that it completely erases the real responsibility for uh, the rise of fascism and the kind of forces which actually lifted uh, initially very small uh, fascist movements uh, into institutional power. Um, if we think of the uh, Italian case first, uh, the um, Fasci di Combattimento, uh, the, um, the uh, organization um, mainly founded by uh, Benito Mussolini in 1919, uh, which arrived in government office in October 1922 and had consolidated a full dictatorship by 1926. Um, its rise uh, was aided at every turn by the bulk of the state apparatus, by serving uh, generals, uh, by um, members of the uh, by officials of the uh, the intelligence service, uh, but also by uh, the main liberal politicians of the time. 
um, in the couple of years before the fascists, uh, or rather before Mussolini became prime minister. So if we think like 1920, 1921, uh, after the great wave of uh, working class mobilization in the Biennio Rosso, the, the post-war factory and land occupations, uh, Confindustria, uh, the main uh, employers federation of Italy, something like the British CBI, um, openly and in great uh, volume uh, funded uh, fascist gangs to go and break up uh, peasant cooperatives, to break up uh, the Camere de Lavoro, which are like local uh, trade trades organizations like uh, sort of union meeting places, um, socialist-led uh, local councils, uh, devastated, burned down uh, by fascists, killing hundreds of people. And the uh, the Italian state, uh, at that time under liberal governments, like those of uh, Ivanoe Bonomi or Luigi Facta, um, its approach was to do nothing to uh, rein in the fascist violence uh, while seeking a kind of pacification. Uh, basically, the, the, mm. the idea behind the liberal policy throughout this period was that uh, the fascism was a response to the rise of fascism and its development into a uh, a, a, a violent uh, movement um, was uh, a response to the sort of evanescent uh, um, Bolshevik threat. So therefore, the way to go about confronting fascism was to suppress the armed left. Um, so uh, in 1921, uh, the uh, uh, government of um, Giovanni Giolitti, a liberal, uh, organized a so-called pacification pact, including the Socialist Party, the main trade union, and the fascists, where they basically all agreed that none of them would be involved in armed uh, struggle. Uh, and what basically this meant was that the police were able to uh, um, raid socialist uh, offices, trade union offices, and gather up all the weapons, uh, whereas the fascists just immediately disobeyed the pact, as in like within days of it being signed. The, uh, the kind of gra more grassroots uh, black shirt organizations in like uh, Emilia Romagna and uh, Tuscany in particular. I wonder, so sorry, David, um, that's all, um, it's all fantastic um, scene setting <laughs> and the detail is, um, the detail is useful, particularly, like you say, the kind of liberal response being to um, imagine that kind of crushing, uh, crushing the threat of the left would be sufficient at the same time to dampen down um, fascism. I suppose the there's no avoiding or evading the issue, though, that the it was a failure of the left to beat fascism. Um, and uh, acknowledging that failure doesn't take away from the res the uh, political culpability of the of various um, aspects of the old elites um, within Italy, Germany, and other countries in Europe uh, that made them complicit with the rise of fascism or how they installed authoritarian far-right figures as a way to um, stabilize their or stabilize the interwar order. But it doesn't take away, at the end of the day, it doesn't take away from the fact that it was a failure of the left to, um, to properly gauge uh, the menace posed by fascism and to um, confront it in the way that would have succeeded in actually beating it? Well, um, in a certain, well, in a, of course, you know, the left thought it could uh, defeat fascism and, and failed to. And so if we read uh, the socialist and from 1921, the, the communist party press, it reads, of course, that they greatly uh, Underestimated the threat faced with, they were faced with. I, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't necessarily deny that, but I think the the problem is is that re I, I don't think that the, um, their failure can be reduced to a, a kind of set of discrete tactical decisions limited to the uh, to the kind of post World War One period itself. Um, I mean, the the problem is is that the uh, Socialist Party of Italy. Uh, in uh, the the post World War One period, and and uh, you know what it inherited from its previous uh, twenty five years of history was uh, extreme um, localism, uh, fragmented organization based on kind of local leaders say so, and 
you know, it was forever kind of excluded from like direct involvement in government, didn't have much institutional strength. Whereas the fascist movement coming off World War One was based on, um, you know, officers in the army. Um, so, um, I mean, I think it just started out from such a massive preponderance. Um, you know, a, a lot of the the failure of the left in understanding the fascist threat really has to do with it overestimating the willingness of liberals, uh, or indeed the capacity of liberals, to restrain fascism within uh, sort of existing institutional frameworks. Uh, basically, because they thought, well, uh, bourgeois democracy is the like highest stage of uh, you know like bourgeois you know like bourgeois rule. Um, but you know, I mean, you can look at like um, sort of individual failures of uh, like local communist and socialist organizations. So, for instance, one strength the fascists really had, which the left never did, was that the fascist uh, organization. Uh, particularly from early 1921, um, didn't operate on the basis of just local groups. What they would do is bring together fasci from lots of different areas and then invade uh, uh, towns where there were, was a strong socialist or communist presence. So they were much better at the kind of purely military aspect of the uh, of the of the of, of the confrontation. And uh, it, the, the, the Communist Party founded in 1921 was relatively slow at building a uh, armed organization. And, and what it did build was more a kind of armed self-defense than something like the fascists had, which was like uh, almost like an army with many tens of thousands of members. So I would um, my instinct would still be to locate the issue in terms of political failure rather than um kind of martial preparedness, or at least the lack of martial preparedness would itself and indicate an underlying political failure of organization or um, clarity, or indeed reflect like the reliance on the liberal state. But I wanted to bring it back to the present, um, because there are two things, I suppose, which connect the um, the kind of detailed Italian history of the post-war, post-First World War period um, to our present in what you said. So the first is that you say the kind of the... Um, that there is a kind of inherited uh, Trotskyist interpretation or um, on the left as to understanding that the failure was um, on the left to properly fight fascism. And that this is kind of, uh, so what you intimated, I suppose, that this is this uh, misunderstanding of the past is what constrains us in uh, Mm -hmm. in, on the left now. so I suppose I would I would contest that because it seems to me that it is um, or at least uh, call put it into question in so far as it seems to me that the that purism comes or the comes or could just as easily be seen as the legacy of the Popular Front and the idea of um, uh, the very strong kind of legacy of uh, lesser evilism. And um, after the fascist menace has already arisen, then the only kind of way to um, to combat it is that everyone has to be mobilized in um, a grand anti-fascist coalition um, that's defined negatively as per the term anti-fascist. So I suppose that uh, it doesn't seem to me that it's so clearly what you suggested is so clearly discriminating in terms of identifying um the way that legacy of the interwar period still weighs heavily on the left, because it seems to me it is just as much um, the the leg, the kind of problematic legacy of the communist parties that also weighs in, on the left at the moment in terms of the way they mis- misunderstand the current situation and how they respond to it. Um, but also um, more, and I mean, I you know, I would uh, agree with you the way what you characterized how different. The current period is from the interwar period, just in term, in I mean, in every single way. Um, but then also the second point, I suppose, is um, what was interesting was you said part of the reason that they underestimated fascism was because they thought that it was um, bourgeois, the highest stage of bourgeois democracy. Whereas now, I don't think anybody would um, cast the defense of existing liberal democracy as the highest stage of anything. And so it's very self-consciously rallying around something that's um, declining. 
and even I would say that they would see it as um, as uh, in the kind of the mind of the anti-fascists now who kind of um, think that uh, we're on the brink, we're in Weimar and on the brink of some cataclysmic um, plunge into genocidal war and authoritarian dictatorship and what have you. I, you know, there's no, um, it's the opposite, surely. They believe that um, liberal democracy is already fascist because it's got people, populists and voters who are racists and xenophobes. And it's run by people like um, Trump um, and Boris Johnson and uh, people has people like Salvini and Farage. And so it's surely the opposite problem that uh, constrains us now, the complete unwillingness to see not only the kind of the continuity of liberal institutions, they don't see that, but they also live in this kind of grim fantasy world as well. And that's the, so it's, it's the opposite problem now, surely. Well, I, I, okay. I, th I think there's two, two elements. I think one is, um, I mean, I would, I, I'd agree with you on the, I mean, if we think of into, I mean, interwar popular frontism also totally failed to stop fascism. Like if we think of France and Spain and so on, the breadth of the political alliance against fascism wasn't the decisive thing. And it was really the Allied victory in World War II that the popular fronts then sort of rode on the on the back of. Uh, there's a there's a really, really bad Italian centre-left politician called Pierre Luigi uh, Bersani. He's like uh, an ex-communist, and now his politics is like Ed Miliband. Uh, and he has <laughs> He has a good quote, which is like, uh, in order to have Bella Ciao, we needed uh, Bangero Rosa. And what he means is like, um, in order to have the forces to fight fascism, you needed to have the belief in the re revolution in order to mobilize uh, the militants. Yeah, a deeply, uh, deeply cynical kind of religious view almost. Yeah. And I think the, the problem is, is that it's a lot easier to mobilize people if they think that what they're fighting against is indeed uh, you know, dramatic and, and de uh, say cataclysmic. Um, and you know, if we look at the contemporary situation, part of the problem, or, or at least say part of the problem from a like, historiographical point of view, is like um, you know, people who live in Western democracies today, um, it's it's like we don't have in our own immediate past experience, you know, in our own lives, in our parents' lives, actually really even our, in our grandparents' lives for the younger generation, we don't have the experience of like mass killing of, of um, and, you know, certainly talking about Europe and North America anyway, you know, we don't have in recent memory like millions of people our own age being sent to war and killed. And so the, 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 the apparently dramatic fascist threat now is because like, well, uh, I, I guess our kind of expectations of the things that could potentially happen are within a very narrow range compared to like all of the political turmoil of the 20th century. Uh, so therefore, I, I guess in terms of wanting to like mobilize people politically, uh, it, it may, it, Oh, it makes sense to to point to this kind of uh, specter, even though really it's imaginary and not based on anything that's uh, actually uh, happening now. It um, seems to me more than it seems to me more than just kind of a convenient tactic. I mean, the idea of kind of resurrecting the worst of the twentieth century as a way to manage the politics of the early twenty first century that seems to me to run deeper than just. Uh, a, you know, kind of a device of um, electoral coalition building. Mm, but I mean, I, I think also the, 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 the thing it's also the flip side of is the lack of any other mobilizing tools. Uh, because like even the worst, yeah, absolutely. Mo most craven, like if we think of all the awful, like if we think of like legendarily bad social Democrats of interwar Europe, that what they proposed was, you know, like Noska, never mind like Kautsky, like what they actually proposed to do was dramatically to the left of, of like the current like German SPD or French socialists yeah. or whatever. Yeah. So all, literally all they can do to try and mobilize um, uh, the, the kind of categories of voters they've been losing in recent yeah. years is this 
is anti-fascism and is this kind of um, uh, bogeyman uh, view of, of the right. So, uh, so you know, just and- to jump in, David, because before we get into a little bit more on the contemporary uses of anti-fascism, which is going to be the bulk of what we're going to discuss here, uh, I think we should just uh, cover what you discuss in your article um, in reference to the German experience uh, of anti-fascism and the um, accusation often thrown at the left that the left was complicit with bringing Hitler to power, um, not deliberately, but uh but by omission, I guess, at least. Um, so mm-hmm. if you could just like quickly summarize that for us. So we have that um, kind of under our belts uh, before we move forward. Yeah, sure. So um, the, uh, the most uh, famous uh, lessons drawn from uh, Weimar Germany uh, revolve around the conduct of the German Communist Party and there are some famous uh, sort of slogans uh, associated with it, one of which is the communists calling the social democrats social fascists, saying that they were just paving the way for fascism. Uh, and one is the slogan, uh, or purported KPD slogan, after Hitler, our turn next, uh, which uh, is uh, t- you know, uh, f- a phrase which appears in the works of historians like uh, uh, William uh, L. Shira. Uh, it's drawn from uh, C.L.R. James via Trotsky, uh, and which basically tells us that the communists uh, deliberately helped um, the Nazis come to power because they wanted to destroy Weimar democracy and therefore uh, ease their own path to power. Um, so it's certainly true that the communists' uh, uh, press uh, over-evaluated the immediate prospect of socialist revolution in Germany in the period of the Depression. Although, as I say, that also had a certain role in mobilizing their own militants. Um, there's also connected myths, for example, the claim that um, the um, communists organized a transport strike together with the Nazis in Berlin uh, in 1932, uh, which is not true. The Nazis made up about 5% of the strikers and the communists didn't involve them in any strike leadership bodies. The claim that the communists and Nazis were uh, in alliance was, was basically a smear campaign promoted by, uh, by sort of liberal press and the social democrat leadership. Um, and I think what's important to understand in the, uh, the, the German case is the way in which um, liberals and mainstream right-wing parties um, helped the Nazis to power, first in, in regional governments, uh, also in suppressing uh, the communists, uh, and then eventually the, uh, the, the very forces who, uh, were, uh, who would supposedly be taken for lesser evils uh, as compared to the Nazis, uh, in fact, um, Directly allied with them. I mean, I had a, a, a couple of uh, a couple of my best ever performing tweets were recently uh, in response to two articles in the Telegraph, uh, one by uh, Norman Tebbit, one by Douglas Murray, uh, each of which uh, claimed that the uh, Nazis were a party of the far left, uh, that liberals and conservatives had stood up against them. Whereas if we look at the uh, the vote on the Enabling Act of 1933, um, not a single liberal, Catholic centrist or conservative MP uh, voted against Hitler or abstained. They all voted for every single one. Uh, and I think that this, <laughs> the, the kind of absence of this fact from the, from the, the debate is rather telling of, of the way it's remembered. Um, so, I mean, m- my point is not that the, the KPD uh, tactics were always good. I think it, even at the level of kind of military preparation, they were, uh, they were, much, they were very uh, much focused on defending the party's own existence, uh, and they weren't really linked to a, a kind of coherent uh, like struggle for power, uh, which the communists could actually have won. Uh, but, but really, my point is that when the chips were down, when they were faced with the so-called Bolshevik threat and the Nazi threat, uh, all liberal, centrist, and sort of supposedly democratic conservative forces all opted for, uh, for the Nazis. So, I mean, the Nazis were worse 
uh, they were a, they were an even worse evil, and the things they did were more uh, and you know right from the start uh, more fundamentally and more violently and with much more death uh, destroyed the left. Uh, but if we think of people like Franz von Papen, the uh, conservative chancellor, or uh, Hindenburg, the president, who the Social Democrats voted for in the 1932 election, um, in, as an alternative to Hitler, uh, they in fact appointed uh, Hitler to power. Um, but I mean, one thing I, I should be clear is I, I I wouldn't want to like paint a kind of picture in which Biden is Hindenburg uh, and and Trump right. is Hitler. I think the the situation is dramatically different in in every way. The the element of political violence is massively lesser, and you know it's qualitatively different, plays a totally different role. My, my point is that the 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 story of the communists' supposed failure to fight fascism is used in order to make a false analogy now, uh, whereby it's the left that is helping out Trump. You know, where supposedly yeah. you know, Sanders supporters are like fate are like uh, you know refusing to vote for Biden, and maybe even there's like policy similarities between uh, Sanders and Trump and, and this kind of thing. Uh, I just think it, it doesn't hold water at all. So, you know, I think correcting the record on the past is, uh, is, 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 is part of that because, because there are organs like uh, Prospect and the Atlantic and so on who want to paint this picture where, you know, basically what they want to say is like, well, uh, Jacobin and the DSA and so on we like want Trump to win because he's like some sort of battering ram against liberalism, which will then allow our rise to power. And it, you know, it isn't what we we say uh, or think mm. uh, at all. And it's something that really has never had any notable presence in left wing politics. Yeah, no, very good, um, very good. Also, to set that historical record straight. And I think, I mean, one thing that comes out clearly in your description as well. I mean, also, you know, my own familiarity with the history is. Precisely that, not so much that there was left wing complicity with fascism, but if anything, it was more liberal complicity with it. Um, and for listeners who want to know a little bit more about this, you should check out episode 58, our interview with Ishai Landa, um, about specifically the similarities between certain economic liberal ideas and fascism. Again, we should be accurate and specific here and not say and not leave it uh to be understood that we're saying that liberals are actually the real fascists or anything like that um the whole point here is to be uh, exactly historically specific and not uh, paint with such a broad brush um but nevertheless but i think i, I mean yeah, i'd on. still well i'd still insist on the fact that i think you know all the kind of historical nuance about the 20th century that you can mobilize can't get around the fact that it was ultimately the task of the left um, well, the, the left failed, obviously, in its revolutionary task, and this is what gave the um, gave the opportunity for fascism to become as powerful and um, as prominent as it did over the course of the 20th century. Um, but also, I mean, the failure of the left to confront and defeat fascism, um, and particularly the, uh, on without the without various uh, without the Popular Front policy that effectively helped to relegitimate um, to relegitimate. Uh, bourgeois rule and capitalism, particularly in the aftermath of the Second World War. So where I, you know, while I take the point about the um, the way in which the kind of these spectres are invoked, as David said, in reference to um, the way Prospect and the Atlantic criticize the left at the moment, saying that they're too, they're kind of complicit with Trump. Um, I don't think that can take away from the fact that it was a left failure. And that obviously doesn't mean that, you um, that that charge today holds water, but I think uh, you know the way to um, the way to exercise those spectres is by making very clear, as you know, as we've already done and have done repeatedly on the podcast, that we don't live in a Weimar moment, and also that Trump isn't a fascist, um, and that everything you know that has been said, our context has simply no comparison, particularly in America of all places, to um, post-war Germany or post-war Italy.
So um, with that in mind, we're going to talk about a couple of different countries as well, uh, as well as the United States, um, about Brazil, about Italy, maybe a bit about contemporary Germany, uh, certainly about France, the UK and the US. Um, talk about experiences, recent experiences of anti-fascism and popular frontism. And I'm going to go first um, because I have the mic and uh, I think and I'm going to talk about Brazil. And I think Brazil, the Brazilian case is one where you could say if there's ever a case to be made that a contemporary leader of a major country is a fascist, you could probably say that Jair Bolsonaro uh, is that man. And I have no doubt that should were historical con- circumstances radically different, uh, that we lived in a, in a situation where there was a genuine revolutionary threat, an organized, perhaps even armed working class, uh, Bolsonaro would be a fascist perhaps to rise um, at, at this moment and to, to save capitalism effectively um, because the capitalists themselves aren't able to do it. Um, which is, you know, what happened with historical fascism. But that isn't the case in contemporary Brazil. Um, for all of uh, Bolsonaro's authoritarian attitudes, um, practices, policies, and so on, uh, he isn't uh, he isn't a fascist. Um, and I've written about on this, um, if you care to check it out. Um, I think th- what happens with anti-fascism today is that, as has already been hinted at in what other people have said, is that it's an attempt to rally... Uh, the left effectively to mainstream organizations, mainstream parties, in an effort to re-legitimate them um, as the kind of main center force holding together the constitution and the republic, um, and thereby defanging the left in its attempt to take down the fascist threat. And, you know, let me be clear, also Bolsonaro is very much a threat and very dangerous and very anti-democratic. He attempted um, a sort of a coup uh, back in March, April. Um, So the threat to democracy is very real, much more real than it is with Trump. Um, Nevertheless, that still makes uh, mainstream anti-fascism a real problem. Uh, Just just to give an example, Folha de São Paulo, the largest newspaper in Brazil, kind of, I guess, like the New York Times or maybe the Washington Post um, of Brazil, is uh, has launched this wear yellow for democracy. Um, so it, the idea is that m- protesters, pro democracy protesters, would wear yellow, um, of course, the color of the national flag, um, in a large, broad based, popular pro democracy movement, which sounds kind of nice. It sounds good, um, but it's worth remembering two things. Firstly, Folha de São Paulo were the ones who led the. Well, one of the main leaders, media cheerleaders of the campaign against the Workers' Party, uh, which led to the impeachment, the soft coup against Juma Hussef and everything that followed from that, leading to the hugely illegitimate Temer uh, interim administration, which all of which paved the way for Bolsonaro. And Bolsonaro saw his ascent through that period because of the complete delegitimation of, uh, of Brazilian democracy through that period. So there was... That role that it played, which and then it now tries to reinsert itself in the discussion and pose as a defender of democracy. Um, and at the same time, you've got, uh, you know, the, the wearing of the color yellow. Of course, it was the right wing anti-workers party demonstrators who all wore yellow and they're trying to recuperate that movement which emerged from the 2013 uh, protests onwards um, into a popular struggle for democracy. Um, but the problem is that Brazilian democracy has become so withered. Um, it's even the kind of liberal institutional checks and balances uh, so degraded, um, more degraded than they already were, uh, that to defend this uh, democracy in the name of democracy is uh, is um, completely two-faced. So I think that there you have a very clear example of um, the limitations of anti-fascism. That doesn't mean that opposing Bolsonaro, even if you want to use the term fascism, I think it's inappropriate, but, you know, so be it, um, that there are lots of exciting and important things going on. There's the organized football supporters who have got gathered together as the uh, the anti-fascist ultras, effectively, um, who had a kind of big street protest in June. Uh, you have the anti-fascist police officers, which is very important, which I've written about separately about the the group of police officers who are trying to call for police reform from within the police service, um, both because of what the police does in society effectively as an internal army, um, which sees swathes of the population, especially poor and black, as enemies, um, enemies to be arrested and and even killed, Um, but also just because of the way that the formation of police in in Brazil is extremely brutal and authoritarian. So you have, for example, gay police officers who have joined up with the uh, anti-fascist cops. So that's all 
good, but I think that we, I think we should be aware of the uses to which anti-fascism is put as a way of bolstering the mainstream parties who themselves were happy to ally with Bolsonaro with, to support Bolsonaro in the second round so as not to support a very soft social democrat from the Workers' Party in the 2018 election. Um, and that would lead to the process just repeating itself. And I guess we can re- discuss these things in light of uh, the U.S. election in just a moment. But um, right now I'm going to turn to David because I want to hear a little bit about Italy, um, just in broad terms, um, about the way that anti-fascism uh, has been used. Because uh, as we've discussed with David previously and in the forthcoming episode, anti-fascism was wielded against Berlusconi. Um, and I think it seems to be uh, done in the same way against uh, Salvini now. So over to you, David. Yeah, I mean, so um, because of the Communist Party's role in the resistance in particular, and then its marginalization after the Cold War, uh, anti-fascism was really important to it to assert its like credibility, uh, its attachment to Republican institutions that emerged from from the war and so on. Yeah. So it's like even in the anti-communist climate of the Cold War, it tried to assert anti-fascism, not anti-communism as the, the kind of governing principle of national politics, even if it was an opposition, yeah? It was still legitimate. And in 1960, uh, there was an attempt to form a Christian Democrat government with fascist support, and there was a successful uh, popular revolt that stopped that from happening. And for the following 30 years, uh, the fascists, the MSI, were totally unable to enter government. Uh, then, in the early 90s, uh, when the Communist Party dissolved itself and began its gradual development into what is today's Democrat Party, uh, which is just a liberal, centrist, in fact, anti-communist party, um, it needed to find some sort of way in which it could rally the left behind it, even as it abandoned any kind of uh, any kind of social progressivism, any kind of uh, sort of economic uh, reformism, except for you know privatizations and uh, join the eurozone, and the the solution it found was anti-fascism. Um, so I, I mean, I, again, I think uh, you know in response to the uh, Berlusconi government uh, formed in 1994, uh, which included former fascists for the first time. Uh, also a kind of cultural climate, particularly like the early 2000s, a kind of advance of like revisionist accounts of um, World War II saying like, well, you know, the communist partisans killed lots of innocent people too. Uh, there's this kind of, there's a thing called the foibe, which is like, um, the, the word foibe means um, like ditches. And basically the idea is like, um, the communists killed thousands of people in northeastern Italy who were all just like innocent people going about their daily business. Uh, and uh, then anti fascist uh, historians suppressed it. But now this could be uh, uh, various kind of controversialists and right wing historians pushed this discussion in the 2000s, often mm. uh, in fact, free and, of and throughout actual all- data. Yeah, and throughout all this period, of course, the the left, uh, which was rapidly withering, uh, was completely ineffectual in kind of doing anything, landing any blows against Berlusconi, I guess, because at the same time as, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but at the same time as they were rallying or trying to rally against fascism and the fascist threat that Berlusconi represented, um, they the, the tools that they wielded against him were in the name of like civility and uh, propriety and all the kind of stuff that you find the U.S. Democrats doing against Trump and also that they tried in the 2000s against George W. Bush, right? I mean, it's the same kind of yeah. um, approach. But, but this is why, this is, I mean, this is also why the historical analogy is so ridiculous because basically the 1920s communist parties are accused of not understanding why fascism was a specific threat based on mass violence, yeah? So, like, the reason... They're, they're accused of failing to understand the difference between, like, liberal democracy and mass violence crushing the workers' movement. And yet today, the, 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 the like, anti-fascist call is supposedly that we should pretend that things which are clearly just uh, liberal bourgeois democracy to pretend that they are, in fact fascist and, and, and full of uh, these violent episodes. I mean, obviously, if Berlusconi's government was indeed tending towards fascism, then the appropriate response would be to build like armed military cells. So 
and not to write to the economist and say <laughs> that fascism is returning yeah or or you know to write a, a, a phd about the notion of the body in the fascist <laughs> era so so, so just, I, just just to, just to jump in because i think i wanted to also discuss france and i mean you're very familiar with france of course you've uh, written histories about uh about uh, french communism so what uh would you say is different if at all with the kind of mainstream french uh, popular front or anti-communist or excuse me anti-fascist approach today um you know at, at every french election it's always uh, wheeled out against le pen that you have to support in the second round any other candidate other than le pen otherwise the fascists win so is that very similar to what's happened in italy are there kind of maybe any one or two distinct points that you care to note about france well, I mean, I think that the, what the French thing shows even more clearly is that uh, is that this doesn't work because when uh, Chirac was standing against uh, Jean-Marie Le Pen in uh, 2000 and, uh, 2002 um, in the second round, uh, he did manage to get most of the left to vote for him and uh, he won 80% of the vote on, I believe, uh, a similarly high turnout. Whereas last time... Uh, Macron beat Le Pen by 66% to 34% on a uh, under 60% turnout, I believe. Um, because basically, if you ask year after year after year, that people continue, people who are former left wing working class voters, if you just go on and on and on telling them that they have to vote for the very neoliberal governments that are attacking them purely in order to defeat the far right, over time, there's a kind of uh, uh, weariness, or you know, a, a kind of um, we say a kind of alarmism fatigue. You know, it's like the the main thing that's going on in both France and in the Italian case is not that the far right electorate is increasing in absolute numbers; it's that the working class left has collapsed, so they get a higher proportion of the vote. Of course, you know, there's that's a very schematic and overall. Uh, picture, yeah. but but I think the fundamental thing is that you just can't um, you you can't just mount this endless last di- ditch action, also because it loses any sense of credibility. So yeah, no, I, I guess I guess just just a just a, a question or maybe kind of a, a thought here because we've we've i guess we've discussed to various extents brazil italy germany you know and the us as well but i mean is is there any i guess one question that that sticks in my mind is what's the appeal of anti-fascism i think we probably all agreed that there isn't a you know in people's day-to-day lives they don't come across a fascist menace as it were it's not in people's practical experience that the the threat of fascism kind of rears its head i mean i guess we've we've i mean i, I guess yeah, my, but my i think is, they genuinely is there, a, is, is there can we generalize across all these different countries and say this is the appeal of anti-fascism we've 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 talked a little bit around a rallying call for the left i mean is it there must be some political role that it's playing it can't just be a shared delusion across all these countries that anti-fascists have can it well a delusion would be wrong though i mean it's ideological and it's um, it has the advantage that it's not defined positively, so you don't have to uh, go through do the work, as they say, of articulating a political program or what that might look like in the current period. Um, it's defined negatively, and it's defined against things that are uh, self, you know, kind of transparently self evidently bad. Um, and indeed, those things, though, at the same time, are also uh, those things that are bad are also understood in liberal terms that the fascists are hostile to diversity, um, that they're repressive of minorities, um, that they're racist and exclusionary. I mean, all of which are true, of course, uh, but also misconstrue the historical purpose of fascism in the 20th century as well, which was its overriding hostility to the workers' movement. So, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, I think that does explain its appeal to some degree, precisely its absence of content or a content that's given by a kind of easy, an easy kind of liberalism, which can be um, taken in from the contemporary kind of uh, status quo and without requiring you to make any effort at uh, putting forward a political vision of the future. Yeah, I think part of the thing too is that it's, 
it does still have some sort of residual uh, power of attraction. Um, I mean, I, th I think it's indicative, if you look at the French case, actually, that younger voters are much more likely to vote for the Front National or Rassemblement National than our older ones. And, you know, partly that's to do with, uh, you know, the recent uh, decade of, of, of crisis and, and so on. But partly it's because, particularly among older generations, the, the kind of absolute anti-fascism and that absolute moral binary does still have some appeal. And uh, no one, in, in the sense that, that very few people would want to be considered a fascist. Uh, so if you can chalk up the various expressions of racism and bigotry and authoritarianism and so on uh, to, to fascism, then that you know, makes the enemy look bad. But I think over time it just loses its uh, loses its power of of, mm. of conviction. Um, I think another element of it is that I mean, like if you if you take something like, of course, this is a, this is a somewhat caricatural example, but but not entirely. I mean, if you take something like Socialist Worker, the paper for the British uh, Socialist Workers Party, um, it you know over the decades has always pointed to the the fascist threat in all its forms. Every group of school of the far right has earned its attention, uh, and it's you know I'm sure a lot of militants of the SWP have played a great role in standing up for victims of uh, racism in particular and in mobilizing against various kinds of bigots. But one thing we would never learn from the pages of Socialist Worker is that in certain periods the far right has got smaller or weaker or become less of a political force. It's always this kind of like a menace that's like just around the corner without ever quite mm -hmm. arriving. And I think it's appeared as partly that it's a, a is it is or at least has been for some decades that it's a, a weak opponent which you can score specific victories over uh, and then you know and claim um claim some strength i mean actually and another thing i'll mention is that um i think it's interesting if you look at the periods in which uh, you know of course the democratic socialists of america have increased in size by uh, more than 10 times over you know, from like 5,000 to more than 60,000 in the last five years. And uh, of course, a lot of that growth has to do with Bernie Sanders' election campaigns and the kind of legitimization of the kind of talk of socialism and, and so on. But if you look at the, the moments when the membership surged, it, was it wasn't really during Bernie's first campaign. The, the first big spike was immediately after Trump's election and then the second was after uh, Heather Heyer was killed in uh, Charlottesville. So I think, like faced with like um, uh, faced with um, th this uh, this threat, and which does have very real and very violent uh, particular expressions, people feel they want to do something. People feel they want to have a, a kind of community of activists they're in. Um, but I think that the, the inherent weakness of it is that it it so easily becomes used as a as a, a just a justification for for supporting uh, various kinds of liberals and, and, and centrists and so on. Yeah, you can and you can bounce it back the other way, which is to say that there is no. I mean, it also tells you about the bankruptcy of liberal centrism as well and the liberal left that they are so dependent on um, kind of stirring the anti-fascist pot to garner what legitimacy they can, uh, but also the weakness of broader, the failure of liberal democracy to be able to rally itself, mm. to kind of rouse itself to meet, um, you know, any the kind of populist challenge or whatever, however you want to phrase it, without relying on um, kind of trying to, uh, trying to bring back the specter of fascism. And that's yeah. so, I, I, I think I think there's I think there's something else there. So we, you know we've we've talked about this point. This it's the the empty signifier. It's got moral appeal. It's a weak opponent. But I think there's something deeper, um, which is essentially that there is a fear of the working class. There is a, a not a fear, a, a despising. This you know who are these fascists? Who are the people who are portrayed as fascists? It's always you know working class people. I think there's that is the element of anti-fascism today which i think is the most pernicious and the most 
clearly a class strategy of the downwardly mobile PMC. I think it's it is important to make. I mean, it might be an obvious point, perhaps to a certain extent, but I think it's important to say that it's there is a void in left politics, which means that there's a draw to towards this. But there's also a really anti-mass kind of impulse, and that and, and that is mm. part and parcel of of anti-fascism, and that's why. I think it's it's important to be quite uncompromising and to and to to point out the anti working class aspects of it when it exists, mm. which which is uh, all across the the context that we've been talking about. I think um, it's really interesting. The um, I think it was last night on Newsnight there was a uh, a section about um, like an anti immigrant anti immigration protest in uh, Dover, and it was like a demo of like three hundred people lots of them wearing kind of like quasi military, you know, kind of like all wearing like camos and um, stuff like that. And, you know, one person with like a swastika. And then we get the voiceover, which kind of tells us that this is like the ordinary people's like fear of immigration is like expressed by this demo, even though wow. it's like a few hundred, like obviously like at least a crowd, including a lot of fascists. So, so I think there's this kind of strange um, sort of idea, which is kind of like um, the masses really are like these fascists and we need to kind of like listen to them and like somehow assuage mm. their concerns. Legitimate concerns. Yeah. Or, but then or, it... <laughs> or exclude them from politics or essentially say, you know, here is a good reason why we need forms of <clears throat> supranational politics or forms of essentially, you know, more or less anti-democratic politics, because you can't really trust the masses. You can't really trust working class people because they'll do stuff like this, like what you were talking about. So I think there's a there's a deep I mean, it's obviously changed a lot. It, it, um, and the current form is is quite different to what it used to be. But I think there is that really like let's let's evacuate politics of any popular sovereignty component because masses can't be trusted. They might do stuff like like this. Yeah, I mean, I, I, um, I've been living in Berlin in the last few months, and uh, it's amazing how prevalent this uh, attitude. But, but also, I, mean, I think what's different in the German left is that people are really totally happy with being explicit about this idea. Um, that it's, you know, it, it's not just like liberals on Twitter or something. It's like people who are members of like activist groups who are really very involved in struggles around like housing and stuff. But who are like very explicit about the like reactionary nature of mass politics that basically and you know they're basically mobilizing like the ideas of like Gustave Le Bon and stuff like that you know it's like the the, the irrational crowd um, and, and ironically that's where you have the strongest lineages between like economic liberal and actually fascist or proto-fascist thought where democracy presents a risk because uh, democracy invites the masses into politics uh, and that uh, that might put uh, the question of private ownership into question or at least, you know, increase taxation at the very least. Uh, and therefore that you need to have anti-democratic means to uh, to in some way circumscribe the masses participation in politics. And there that, you know, that is the, the road to fascism. I mean, at least that, th those are the uh, initial little kernels which uh, lead down that road. So I think that's very clear. Um, I was going to add one more thing just in terms of the appeal of anti-fascism. I think just to add to the point about the bankruptcy of any other alternative political program. So you have to kind of keep uh, keep going down the well of, uh, of anti-fascism uh, for that last few drops uh, to keep to give you sustenance is the idea that, you know, I think we live in kind of post moral times. So, you know, people don't really make any kind of real moral arguments with any significant foundation. It's a lot of shouting, and I don't like that, ultimately. Um, and the only thing that seems to provide any moral certainty is, well, we don't want the Holocaust. You know, the Holocaust is kind of our only kind of real moral touchstone. Um, and therefore... The reference to anti-fascism and appeal to anti-fascism is always uh, a, an appeal for the kind of what little moral certitude you can gather up uh, with this very flimsy foundation of, well, we just want to avoid uh, the most violent, horrific uh, violence in, that's ever been perpetrated in human history. You know, that's the only thing that we can uh, kind of stand on. Um, and I, I, I think finally there's maybe an element of, uh, of, of inventing the dreams, inventing the dystopias that we, uh, that we want, you know, that the, 
the specter of fascism actually provide some sense of comfort um, rather than living through confusing times and having to be creative and come up with new political answers which are adequate to the tasks uh, that are set to us today you end up having to um, to trying to repeat um, what seems to be uh, something easier more tractable well you know fighting the fascists then we just take up arms and uh, and there you have your solution there's your politics but they don't take up arms. I mean, it's and a point they don't. And they don't. Well, as well. Exactly. The, and that's, and that's the real the, irony of it. It's the LARPing. It's precisely the LARPing and the middle class, um, liberal middle classes of the day imagining themselves uh, because they have to stand in a queue to, you know, get a visa to go to Europe, um, imagining that that means they're living under fascism. How much they enjoy that is really kind of, um, I mean, you know, morally repulsive, but also very peculiar. Um, but there is an, you know, there is an effective dimension to enjoying anti-fascism, and I think that's what, um, or with, by which obviously it means kind of enjoying, enjoying the fantasy that you're living under fascism because you lost the last election, um, and that is yeah, it gives uh, it gives all of your actions, well, it gives all of your actions a delicious kind of danger and a moral high ground, and that is you know, quite intoxicating. Just to round this out, um, I think it might be nice to refer back to the USA where we started, where uh, apparently they're having an election in uh, in a month and a half. <laughs> and think about who knows? What, who knows? Well, indeed, yeah. Um, and also, best lots of, I'm hearing of this, the fascists <laughs> will try and steal it. Well, exactly. Or you know, Trump's not will refuse to leave office and so on. I mean, no doubt there's a lot of shenanigans <laughs> going on with the voting machines and whatnot. But uh, you know, um, now I'm sounding like Trump uh, casting aspersions on the voting machines. Damn, that's not where I wanted to go. But anyway, to bring us back around and to close this out, uh, what do we think? Uh, you know, are the prospects for uh, this very damaging um, and exhausting liberal anti-fascism? Should firstly Trump win, and secondly, should Biden win? Um, where does that uh, Where does that leave us? Um, where, where Where will that leave us any prognoses uh, well, if biden wins if biden wins it'll be shut off you know very quickly almost i'd say like flipping a light switch if trump wins um we'll see kind of the hysteria be riled up to um ever greater spasms of stupidity irrationality and incoherence i think david i'm i'm less optimistic because i think as soon as biden wins uh, then you know, then, then the campaign to stop like Tucker Carlson or whoever being president will 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 begin a pace because Biden's not going to do anything to uh, resolve the massive public health emergency in all its different forms or the climate crisis or the jobs crisis, uh, which are which are undermining the democratic uh, base. And then the easiest thing to do is to to rally around the troops is to is to use uh, anti-fascism against whoever the next opponent is. Uh, by the, I mean, I you know the the Economist published a poll a couple of months ago saying that uh, more than forty percent of Democrat voters uh, think that the election should be rerun if uh, Trump wins uh, the electoral college without winning the popular vote. Uh, you know, I think the electoral college is a reactionary institution. But you can hardly dispute the results based on who won. And of course, in Britain, that has a, a recent uh, bad uh, experience as well. Um, so, I mean, I think people are going to lose their shit if Trump uh, wins again. But I mean, I, I suppose also the question is, you know, even if even if Trump loses, and and I mean, I, I think uh, the. Uh, you know, I mean, there's there's this kind of thing which is like, well, you know, like now everyone says uh, that uh, Trump is a uh, horrible monstrosity such as has never existed before, whereas good old George W. Bush and Ronald Reagan and so on were like honest uh, center-right figures. So the question is, is, you know, in 10 or 20 years' time, will we look back on Trump as an aberration <laughs> or, or will he in turn be invited on Ellen DeGeneres' well, show? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Or, or will exactly. Ellen be invited on his show? When yeah, he there we one. go. Yeah. Uh, George, no, I mean, the... George, last word. Um, is uh, Will a Trump victory no. hasten the end of knobs of neoliberal order breakdown syndrome and all the associated kind of liberal anti-fascism that goes along with it? I mean, I think anti-fascism is a symptom of the weakness of the left. Um above all else and so when the you know whatever happens in the election that's not going to suddenly provide a system 
a systemic alternative, which is, you know, one of the things the left needs to do. And so, yeah, I mean, it might take a different form. And I think a lot of things that David said is are probably right. But no, it'll just, it'll, there'll be another target. There's always another fascist lurking around the corner. So I'm sure the, the, the creativity of the liberal anti-fascists will find a new target, whoever ends up winning. If, I mean, if, if Biden ends up winning, that is. Okay, very good. Uh, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much once again, uh, David. Uh, always welcome on Alpha Bunga Bunga. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Excellent stuff. Okay, and that's it uh, for us uh, for this week. Uh, we'll catch you later. Bye bye. Um, hey, uh, yeah. But we've never actually done kind of Silvio himself. Yeah. You should have sought his uh, official endorsement somehow. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it's not that hard to... <laughs> um, you know, ideally, though, it wouldn't be like to get, you know, his sponsorship or like to get him to say, you know, this is the best podcast ever. The, what you'd want is like for him to get a selfie with somebody wearing the shirt or something like that. That's what you'd really want. Yeah. Yeah, yeah sure. Or at least him to criticise us and to say this is <laughs> against everything I stand for. Yeah. <laughs> that would this be okay is, too, actually. To be this fair. is a perversion of all You're of using my, my, my image values for Marxism. <laughs> <laughs> you could um, you could get him to um, do a kind of King Solomon's judgment to, <laughs> between you and the other one. <laughs> I thought you were going to say among the three of us as to who's the most loyal, the most loyal. Uh, embodier of the tradition that would be interesting whom is most loyal to the tradition of Silvio have, have, have you seen this site uh, called cameo.com no, no never so um m my friend uh, had this for his birthday from his girlfriend last week so basically it's just like a site where you pay like z list celebrities to like issue a message just saying like anything like for your birthday or something yeah and uh, Rachel Dolezal is one of the people, and you can pay thirty-two dollars. <laughs> for... <laughs> Good value that. That is brilliant. They also have uh, Chris Hansen, you know, the guy off to catch a predator. So it's I like you, you get a video of him calling your friend a pedophile, and that. <laughs> <laughs> he, he alone has like two thousand reviews, so he must have made like a hundred grand just repeating his catchphrase. Jesus Christ! It would be a tragedy if Rachel Dawson was replaced by a, a deep fake. <laughs> but, uh, but but in the one for Ushin's birthday, she called for a thirty-two county republic of Ireland. So Is she she's Irish now, I guess, no longer black or something. No, no, no. You can you, she'll just say whatever you like. To be fair, I'd take that gig. I'd probably say whatever anybody uh, that's what, they paid for, th for thirty-two bucks, <laughs> which yeah, is that, what, which is what probably, this podcast is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was about to say that that was an enormous cell phone. That <laughs> but, uh... <laughs>